Well, good morning, everyone. How are you this morning? Good? Okay. Please open your Bibles in the passage we just read, 1 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 16. And the title for the sermon of today is Advice for a Young Pastor. Advice for a Young Pastor. But before entering into the sermon, let's pray again. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day and thank you for this beautiful opportunity we have to gather here in this place to worship your name and to listen to your word. And now that we're going to listen to your word preach, we ask you to talk to our hearts and minds and we ask you that your Holy Spirit open our eyes and our hearts to receive your word and to receive what you want to communicate to us in this morning. We ask you to use the preacher so that the words that comes from my mouth can be your words. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the things that happens to all of us when we were young or younger was to think that we knew everything. And we can see this when teenagers are advised by their parents. Usually, teenagers hate when their parents advise them because it makes them that their parents are spoilers or that they are boring and always want to ruin everything. However, as we grow older and experience more and more real life, we realize that our parents were right in everything they told us and that they did it for our good. Indeed, youth is one of the most important formative stages of our life because it is in that most of the important decisions that affect our lives forever are made. What we study, who we marry, what we work, etc. And likewise, it is also a stage where due to inexperience, we can make many mistakes, many of them very harmful. In the passage we're going to consider this day, we see the Apostle Paul, an old and experienced pastor and apostle, counseling his son in the faith, Timothy, who was a young and inexperienced pastor. Timothy had the difficult task of shepherding a church with many difficulties and challenges, false teachers and heresies being the greatest of them. But Paul instructs, instructs this young pastor to lead this church in the right way. The main truth we find in today's passage is that no matter how young a pastor is, he must be faithful to the Lord and faithful to the ministry God has given him. No matter how young a pastor is, he must be faithful to the Lord and faithful to the ministry God has given him. And in this text, we find six pieces of advice that Paul gave to the young Timothy and that constitute six pieces of advice for a young pastor. Let's look at each piece of advice separately. Advice number one, don't pay attention to unimportant things, but train yourself for godliness. Don't pay attention to unimportant things, but train yourself for godliness. Verse 6 of this chapter of 1 Timothy 4 begins by saying, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. This is intimately connected with what Paul had told Timothy in verses 1 to 5 that we saw last week about, a, about the apostasy to come in the end times. If Timothy taught those things to the church, uh, he would be a good servant of Jesus Christ. 
And it is interesting that the word translated servant in this verse is the same word from, uh, from, for deacon, diaconos. And although in this case it is not referring to the office of deacon, since we know that Timothy was a pastor, not a deacon, um, nevertheless, it refers to what a pastor is. The pastor is a servant. This word was used to refer to a waiter, someone who served tables, a servant. And that is exactly what a pastor should be, should be a servant. While it is true that the pastor got, has a God delegated, get delegated authority to lead the church, and God also commands church members to submit and obey to their shepherds in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. This doesn't mean that pastors are dictators or tyrants who abuse or control the flock, but that they are servants who serve and lead the sheep by example. If Timothy would apply the counsel and teachings of the Apostle Paul, he would be a good servant, diaconus, of Jesus Christ. And this is where we find the first advice in verse 7. Let's read that again. Verse 7, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myth. Rather, train yourself for godliness. This advice consists of two mandates. One is expressed in the form of a prohibition, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myth and another expressed in the form of, an, of, an, of a command. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Timothy was not to waste time with a reverent and absurd myth, but was to train himself for godliness. This myth had to do with the false teachings that false teachers were propagating in the Fishing Church. Although we do not know for sure what this myth consists, but we know what they had to, uh, that they had to do with endless genealogies, as chapter 1, verse 4 say, and an incorrect use of Jewish law, as we see in chapter 1, verses 8 to 11. Also, from what we saw last week in verses 1 to 5, this false teaching had to do with ascetism, that is, refraining from doing good things that are not bad, such as getting married or eating certain foods. All this Timothy had to avoid. Timothy should not waste time on these teachings that didn't benefit at all, but on the, but on the contrary, harm those who entered into them. Instead, Timothy was to train himself for godliness. The word translated for training in this verse it's a Greek word, gymnase, from our word gymnasium comes from, or gym. The idea behind this metaphor is that Timothy had to train hard to be a godly Christian, just as an athlete has to put, it, put in hours of hard, of hard training to achieve the desired end. The reason Timothy had to train hard for godliness was because doing so has promise of this present life and of the life to come. Exercising our bodies has many benefits that improve our health. According to an article, doing physical exercise helps maintaining a healthy weight, strengthen bones and muscles, intellectual functioning, our memory, effectiveness at work, self-control, self-esteem, body image, etc. Also, exercising reduces anxiety, low mood, general pain, etc. So, you must do workout. There is no doubt that doing physical exercise is something good and beneficial for our health. However, exercising for godliness is much more profitable than physical exercise. Because as our text says, it has promise of this present life and of the life to come. Godliness has to do with a life of devotion to God, a life given completely to God. A godly person is one who is dedicated 
to live in for God and honoring Him and giving Him glory in all that they do. This word is very important in this letter, so much that it appears nine times in this letter and eleven times in the, in the pastoral letters in First and Second Timothy and Titus. For Paul, godliness was very important because godliness is the result of sound doctrine. And Timothy was to train himself for godliness. Every believer, and this includes pastors and non-pastors, should exercise for godliness. Now, how do we do it? Just as there, just as there are different physical exercises, so there are numerous spiritual exercises. One of them is reading and meditating on the scriptures. A Christian should be someone who reads daily and meditates on the Bible. It must be someone who, who says like the psalmist in Psalm 197, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. We must desire as a newborn children the pure milk of God's word so that by it we may grow up unto salvation, as 1 Peter 2.2 says. A Christian who doesn't read and meditate on the scriptures is like an athlete who doesn't eat healthy. When the day comes to compete, he will not be able to run. Likewise, the Christian who does not feed on the word of God will not be able to face the temptations and attacks of the devil. Another spiritual exercise we should do for godliness is prayer. As we were taught as children when we went to Sunday school, God speaks to us through the Bible, and we speak to God through prayer. Prayer is one of the most powerful weapons we have as Christians, but at the same time, is one of the most neglected. The Bible gives us so many commands urging us to prayer. We must pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. We must pray at all times in the Spirit, in all prayer and supplication, Ephesians 6.18. We must persevere in prayer, watching over it with thanksgiving, Colossians 4.2. And so we could continue with many other passages. Another spiritual exercise we should do for godliness is to gather regularly. God doesn't want us to live the Christian life alone, but wants us to live in community. In order to help each other grow in our Christian work and thus apply the love of Christ in practical ways in our relationships with brothers and sisters. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There are many other exercises that we could mention, but for the moment we will only stay with these three. But I would like to ask you this morning, how much time do you spend reading and meditating on the Word each day? How high a priority is God's Word in your life? Do you know God's Word, meditate on it, memorize it? How much time do you spend in prayer? Could you say that you are disciplined in prayer, or do you only pray when you are in trouble? Do you consider that you, you pray without ceasing? Do you congregate regularly? Do you seek fellowship with your brothers and sisters? Evaluate yourself considering these questions and seek to make necessary improvements before the Lord. Paul's first piece of advice to the young pastor Timothy is to not pay attention to unimportant things, but train himself for godliness. A pastor should be someone who doesn't waste time on things that do not benefit his spiritual life or the spiritual life of his church. But the pastor must be trained for godliness. He must be a man given to God and devoted, who is an example to believers, as we will see later. <laughs>
In verse 9, Paul says that the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That is, what he had told him in the previous verses about exercising godliness is something that should be received and accepted by all, both pastors and church members. We must all train ourselves for godliness. To this end, Paul toiled and strived in ministry. And these two words in the Greek language are very strong. The word that is translated as toil has the idea of working hard to the point of tiredness and fatigue. And the word that is translated as strive is the same root where the word agony comes from and gives the idea of fighting, competing for a prize, or fighting an adversary, or striving hard to achieve something. That is, ministry is not easy. It requires hard work to exhaustion, an agonizing effort. So Paul describes it. But they did so because they had placed their hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Verse 10. The reason Paul worked so hard was because he had put his hope on the living God. God is the Savior of all people in the sense that he has provided in Christ sufficient salvation for all and in the sense that God wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth of chapter 2 verse 4 says. However, God is the Savior especially of those who believe because to them the benefits of redemption are applied. We find this same idea in 1 John 2.2 where it says, He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. So we saw advice number one. Now we're going to see advice number two. Command and teach. Verse 11. This is exactly what verse 11 says. Command and teach these things. Timothy was to command and teach what Paul had instructed him. And pastors are to command and teach what God has revealed in his word. The word command here has the idea of expressing an instruction or a command. As I, said, as, as, as I said earlier, pastors have an authority that has been delegated by God to lead and direct the church. However, this authority does not reside in the pastor, but in the word of God that he must communicate and teach. The pastor submits to God's word and with the authority of God's word, commands others to straighten out their lives to conform to God's will. The pastor has the primary task of commanding and teaching all that is in God's word. Pastors have the responsibility to announce the whole counsel of God to, the ch to their churches. Something similar, Paul says to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verse 15, where it says, Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. The pastor has the authority to declare, exhort and rebuke, and the church has the duty to obey and submit to its pastors, as the author says to the, to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, where it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And it is necessary to make the clarification that authority does not mean control or, or tyranny or abuse. Authority is not a bad thing. We all have authorities, and authority is for our good. For example, the police is our authority, and they watch over our safety. If one day a policeman stops us for speeding and gives us a ticket, we should not feel that we are being abused, but, the, but that we are being protected. Likewise, when the pastor must correct, confront, rebuke, or counsel someone, it is not for their evil, but for their good. Advice number three, let no one despise you for your youth, 
but be an example to believers. Verse 12. Verse 12, it says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Timothy was a young pastor. And in that society, someone was considered young from his teens to his 40s. So we can assume that Timothy was a pastor under 40 years old. And being young could be a cause of contempt on the part of some church members. It is very common for young pastors not to be taken seriously by church members who are more mature and older than they are. Perhaps they think that because of his youth, he is immature and inexperienced, and that he has nothing to offer older people. However, for Timothy, this shouldn't be an obstacle, but an encouragement and a motivation to be an example for the church. The word translated as example here comes from the Greek typos, used here, um, and it means model or a pattern. In fact, it is a word that used to talk about statues. In other words, the pastor should be the example or model, the pattern of what the church should be like. And these words may seem exaggerated to us, but it is true. It is true that no one is perfect, not even pastors. Pastors also sin, in case you, did not, you didn't know that. And it is also true that we should all seek to be like Christ. However, the pastor should live in such a way that he can say, like Paul, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1. And that is why pastors have a high moral standard that they must meet, as we see in chapter 3 of this letter. Timothy was to be an example in five things. In a speech, that is, his speech must be proper and correct, not incurring sins of the tongue, such as bad words, gossiping, slandering, cursing, inappropriate jokes, etc., but words that are for the building up of the church and give grace to those who listen. Ephesians 4, 21. 29, sorry. Second, in conduct. That is, his conduct should be blameless and exemplary. The pastor should be someone of a clean testimony who does not have a questionable reputation that stains the gospel. Also must be an example in love. Timothy was to be an example of love for others. He was to always take the first step in loving the brethren, even when there were people in his church who did not love him. In the same way, the pastor should be an example of love for his congregation, both in the way he loves God and in the way he loves his brothers and sisters and his neighbors. Number four, in faith. This word can also mean faithfulness. The pastor must be an example of faith to others. He must be someone who trusts and rests fully in God and who lives a life of faithfulness to God. And number five, the pastor should be an example in purity. And here purity has to do specifically with sexual purity. The pastor should be an example of purity in the way he deals with the opposite sex in his faithfulness to his wife or in his chastity, in the case he is single. Pastors should also avoid sexual sins of all kinds. And we should mention that these commands apply not only to the pastor, but also to all of us. We should all strive to be examples in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Advice number four. Take care of the ministry of the word. Verse 13. It says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. As Paul was to visit Timothy, he was to devote himself in the public reading of the Scriptures, exhortation, and teaching. In other words, he was to devote himself to the ministry of the Word. As a pastor, Timothy was to give high priority to his primary ministry, that of the teaching and preaching the word of God. 
This requires that the scriptures be read in the public worship service, as we read scriptures just today. Reading the scriptures publicly was done in Jewish synagogues, where they would have a time to read long portions of scripture, and then someone would explain them. Likewise, Timothy was to give priority to the public reading of the scriptures and the preaching of the scriptures. Timothy was also to exhort, and this word literally means to encourage or to comfort, and has to do with applying God's word to people's specific situations. One of the pastor's main tasks is to counsel church members who come to him with their personal problems or issues. The pastor must always be ready to apply God's word in practical ways to the situations of his members. Likewise, Timothy was also to devote himself to the teaching of the word of God. Teaching the Bible is one of the primary tasks of a pastor. And it is for this reason that pastor must be qualified, must be able to teach, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. The preaching and teaching of the word is extremely important to the church. And God has called pastor to primarily perform this task. As 2 Timothy 4, 1-2 says, I charge you in the presence of God and of, and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Advice number five, develop your spiritual gift, verse 14. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Timothy was not to neglect his spiritual gift, but it was to use and develop it in ministry. <clears throat> this spiritual gift had been given to him by a prophecy with the laying hands of the council of elders or, or the presbytery. Apparently, Timothy tended to be shy and not very proactive at times. So Paul exhorts him elsewhere in 2 Timothy 1.6, 1, uh, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. We don't know which gift Paul is, Paul is referring to here, but we can assume that it has to do that, uh, with the ministry of teaching the word of God. The pastor should not neglect the gifts God has given him, but develop them in the church. It is very common to see how a young pastor who comes to a church develops develops his gifts, improving more and more over time. That is why churches must also be patient with their pastors, knowing that experience is something that is gained over time and the gifts God has given are put into practice. A musician does not become an expert from the first time he uses his instrument, but it, but it is with the time and with practice. Likewise, all of us have spiritual gifts, at least one, that God has given us, and he expects us to use it in his service. We must not neglect the gifts God has given us, but use them for the good of the church and for the glory of God. And advice number six, the last advice. Keep a close watch on yourself and the teaching. Verses 15 and 16. In verse 15, Paul calls Timothy to engage in the things he had commanded him in all these verses, so that all might see his progress. And finally, he gives his, this last piece of advice in verse 16. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. Above all, Timothy had to keep clo a close watch on himself. He had a great responsibility on his shoulders, and upon his spiritual integrity and faithfulness to ministry depended the spiritual health of his church. That's why Paul warned him to take care of himself and the teaching. A similar command is found in Acts 20:28, 20, where we find, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers 
to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. The reason Timothy had to keep a close watch on, his, on himself and the teaching is because doing so would save himself and those who hear. These strong words can, can cause confusion. What does Paul mean here by you will save both yourself and your hearers? This seems to conflict with salvation being by grace through faith. The word save here can also mean preserve or deliver. This can mean that Timothy would preserve himself and his church from falling into doctrinal errors such as some had fallen into. But it can also mean that Timothy would be, uh, would be faithful to the Lord and his ministry, would grow in his salvation, sanctification, uh, to the end, and the sanctification of his church. Although final salvation is guaranteed in Christ, we have the responsibility to persevere in the truth of the gospel and grow in sanctification. So finally, pastors must take care of themselves because by taking care of themselves, they will also take care of their congregation. If a pastor neglects his spiritual life and begins to slide into sin, that is going to have negative repercussions in the life of his congregation. And in closing, I would like to mention these six pieces of advice again that we saw this morning. Advice number one, pay no attention to unimportant things, but train yourself for godliness. Advice number two, command and teach. Advice number three, let no one despise you for your youth, but be an example to believers. Advice number four, take care of the ministry of the word. Advice number five, develop your spiritual gift. And, adv and advice number six, keep a close watch on yourself and the teaching. And if anyone here does not yet know Christ, and is therefore not saved, I would like to recall what, what the final part of verse 10 of this chapter says. God is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. I ask you this morning, have you believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? God made provision for you to be saved by sending His only Son to die on the cross for you. So we encourage you to believe, and repent, believe in Christ today so that you will be saved and have eternal life. Let's pray for, for finishing. Thank you, God, for this time we could have spent in your word. We ask you to apply your word to our hearts and to use us during this week to apply what you have taught us in this morning. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen.